Shall we live? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out on this beautiful, warm evening. Cold evening. Can you please stand for the flag? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. One nation first item on agenda tonight is uh superintendent's report okay. okay well thank you very much i'm glad we have a crowd we have a great couple of presentations tonight uh for you uh we're going to do a little bit of around the district we're going to talk a little bit about our rti programming in the k-5 a proposal that uh, the board is going to hear and then we're going to do the uh, much anticipated uh, budget presentation. <laughs> uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the Positive Connect program at the high school. So as I go around the district, I just continue to be proud of the work of our teachers and staff. I was walking around with Dr. Foy the other day, and this young uh, student ran into the hallway. So excited to see Dr. Foy. He had to show him a drawing that he drew just for him of his Ninja Turtles. And I just thought that was adorable. <laughs> and uh, there's just love in, in, the, in the air. When you see a principal and a kid connect like that, and I just really wanted to highlight that and appreciate it. Um, and it's a great thing that we see in our school. Um, again, walking around the district, seeing a lot of great small group instruction, seeing kids working in centers, teachers preparing very detailed plans so that kids could be engaged in learning. Um, these two little girls were doing a reading uh, partnership where they were reading their stories to each other and giving each other feedback. It's adorable when you watch first graders give each other feedback. <laughs> <laughs> This uh, was a small group uh, instruction yeah. lesson where they were focused kindergarten, which was focusing on just um, recognizing patterns. And the kids were not only engaging with their teacher, but turning and talking. It's just another example of just really good pedagogy in our schools, uh, as well as one-to-one uh, -one instruction focused on uh, phonemic awareness in the younger grades, which helps to boost uh, reading abilities and students just engaged in learning. So it's just, it's just so joyful to be in each of the buildings and watch the, the passion that our teachers bring to their classes as well as the excitement. Uh, this girl likes to read in her little palace. Uh, so just another example of the teacher being creative and creating interesting spaces for kids to read uh, you know, and, and enjoy learning. Um, and again, this teacher came up with an idea on Friday, flashlight Fridays. So the kids bring their flashlights in, they turn out the lights and they focus on uh, you know, identifying the words and reading. It's a way to kind of help them kind of focus on the words, but it's also fun for the kids. They feel like they're in a campfire environment. Uh, and it's just another beautiful example of teachers being creative and coming up with great ways to engage kids, uh, more sitting on the carpet and talking. I love listening to the ideas and the thoughts of the kids and the way the teachers elicit that from their students. It's just beautiful. And it's hard to express in, in words or even pictures how beautiful it truly is. But um, and, and I think we appreciate it much more now, uh, having come out of COVID where we couldn't get close together on the carpet in these areas and things of that nature. Uh, and this girl uh, jumping out of her chair to answer <laughs> a, a math problem, like, ooh, ooh, like Mr. Borshak. And again, just like captured like a really exciting moment, uh, you know, with a kid who just you know, wanted to share so much with her teacher about what she was learning. So again, just love getting around, getting into classrooms, seeing these things going on uh, and celebrating our teachers and the work they do with our students, because that's what we're here for. And when we talk about the budget tonight, it is about finances. It is about the community tax dollars, but really it's also about uh, the promise that we make to our kids uh, for their future and their education. Um, and then we had uh, one night where we got to go to a, a school board association meeting. Uh, some of the board members and Dr. Gerges and I met uh, with uh, Thomas Napoli, our state um, comptroller, and he gave us kind of an overview of things that are uh, heading to New York State. And, uh, and then subsequently the budget uh, from the government, the governor came out 
and we did get the state aid we were promised. So that's going to affect our budget in a, in a really positive way so that we can continue to support our students. And you'll hear all about that tonight as well. But first, um, Julian Macris is going to share with us a couple of things going on from the PPF fund. So um, currently we have our UPK registration underway right now. Um, this, this is kindergarten, but UPK is happening right now. We have about 117 families who have expressed interest in the UPK program for next year. Um, we also just wanted to mention that kindergarten registration is also underway. So if you have children that are born between December 2nd, 2017 and December 1st, 2018, that they are eligible for kindergarten enrollment. This is just the registration process. The screening happens in May. And then last year, we added a second screening in June at the buildings. Um, we had a committee put together and the elementary principals helped. So that was a big success. So just something we're excited about. We're starting our registration for UPK and kindergarten again. Um, today, I sent out an email to all parents about uh, PS I Love You Day, which will be recognized in our school district on Friday, February 10th. It's an organization that um, brings awareness to mental health and also just the main focus is on kindness and spreading kindness. But as part of that initiative, next Wednesday for parents and guardians, we're going to be holding a QPR training, which is question, persuade, and refer. And Ms. Ronnie Goldman, who's the Director of Development at the Neighborhood House with Ms. Catherine Duffy, who's the Director of Healthier You at Stony Brook, they're going to be facilitating this training via Zoom to recognize the signs and symptoms of an individual who may be in crisis. And the focus is really on response. So all parents and guardians are welcome to attend that on Wednesday, February 8th. Um, we had our first, as we mentioned back in August and September, we had our first session of Pause and Connect. Um, at the high school, um, I'm going to share some feedback that I received from Mr. Hoffer, uh, feedback received from teachers and students. Of course, this is in the pilot year. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to talk to all students and all teachers, but we will be serving the staff and students at the end of the year. But just some positives. Um, the teacher said students were laughing and smiling. They were working together. Some students who may not have been thrilled with the activity said it was a nice break in the day. Some people mentioned they were they got to meet some new people. Um, some of the senior homerooms were able to have conversations about life after high school and the transition to college. One comment a teacher made is they're often fighting with kids to put the phones away. And they, he said that he didn't have to say that once because they didn't see any phones out. Uh, Mr. Hopper met with his pr principal advisory committee today, which is made up of students from all different <laughs> groups and organizations, and he said the, the feedback thus far was overwhelmingly positive, and we know kids are very honest, so they also had some constructive criticism for us that we hope to um, improve. And then the Wizards, I think we're on behalf of the PTA Council Presidents. They're going to be hosting the Wizards, right, Dr. Yep. Harris, for all our students on March 2nd, 6.30 p.m. in the Sable High School gym. So thank you to our PTAs and all of the buildings for that. And as Dr. Ferris shared in um, an email, I guess about two weeks ago now, the World Languages Art and Music Department are putting on a multicultural festival at the high school Monday, March 6th, to kick off World Languages Week. So we encourage all families, staff, students, if you would like to be involved in the festival and host a table, you can scan that QR code and it gives the instructions. But we invite everyone to attend. Thank you, Julia. Um, at this point, we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Persioni and the uh, elementary principals. But before we start, I just want to say that you know, from the moment I got into the district, uh, talking to teachers in each of the elementary school buildings, talking to families, um, had a faculty meeting with all the teachers coming together, sharing what they felt was most needed in schools. One of the messages that I heard loud and clear was when we have students who struggle in our classes with reading or math or those particular academic areas, we know we can do a lot, but we have 20 students in the room and we really need alternate pathways to kind of help students uh, kind of get support. And it's not always the answer to just refer to classify for special education. There are there other ways we can do this? And we heard loud and clear that there was a need for additional 
academic intervention supports at the elementary school level. Uh, my charge to the principals was, I, yes, I believe in that wholeheartedly, but I also want to look at the structure and the way we do it so that we can do it in a research-based way that is super uh, supportive of those teachers in their pursuit to help all kids uh, meet the needs of uh, elementary school. And our goal should be that every single child leaves our elementary schools on grade level or above in reading, writing, and math. And I think it's really um, important to strive for that. And to, but you can't just strive for it. You have to support that. And so in the budget proposal tonight, you're going to hear about some additional positions we'd like to add to our elementary schools. But it really comes from this conversation with our teachers and our principals about what is needed. And that's what this presentation is. So without further ado, our assistant superintendent for instruction and our three building principals. Thank you for coming tonight and presenting today. Thank you. I'm just going to ask the principal. And thank you, Dr. Ferris. We're very excited to share some of the work we've been doing. And certainly we have been listening to the staff and to our families with the focus groups. So many pieces of data, but we've also been looking at the work that we've done over the years, and we have done a tremendous amount of work. Yes. So uh, we are going to give a little a, a reminder to the board because we presented on RTI in the past multiple times over the years and over the, the improvements that we've made. So we're going to touch upon that. We're going to touch upon some of the research out there and touch upon what we currently have in our buildings and what we would love to have in our buildings. So I just wanted to give a quick overview on that. And obviously, we know Mrs. Carlson, Dr. Ein, and Dr. Floyd, who will be joining me at different points. So what do we believe in? Well, we believe that the early childhood years are among the most important in every child's social, emotional, and academic growth. We believe targeted instructional practices in these early years are a proactive approach to student success throughout the grades. Providing academic intervention for students who are struggling, the use of small groups to provide targeted instruction, co-teaching, and a focus on improving outcomes for elementary students will help reduce the number of special ed referrals and help all of our students to meet success in the future. So academic intervention is truly part of our belief is that it's designed for our students who struggle in an academic area. Um, we focus mainly on English language arts and mathematics, um, but we are through the interventions, we're able to provide that extra help and support that students need, whether it be not needing grade, grade level expectancy in a certain area or a specific concept. Come on. <laughs> Come on in. Um, decisions. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. So decisions are made um, at our problem solving team, which is a cross section of the different experts that we have in the elementary world sitting together in a team based approach. We meet on a weekly basis to discuss mm -hmm. our students and uh, their strengths and the areas that we need to focus on, whether it be um, a specific skill or, like I said, a, a grade level area, um, in, but we use that diagnostics, we use classroom data, we're using formal and informal observations, we've got great software that allows us to bring everything together, and of course our teachers are also a part of that, that classroom input is extremely valuable when we're trying to interview with any child. So small group instruction is one of the building goals that we're focusing on across all three elementary buildings. It allows for a decrease in student to teacher ratio, as well as the ability where we can further differentiate and also um, really individualize the instructional approaches when meeting with those students. So um, just this is a little refresher on response to intervention. Um, this is a graphic that I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with, but the re response to intervention model has three tiers. So three times a year, what happens is we screen all of our students using a diagnostic, and then we use other data like Dr. Foy referred to, including classroom performance, teacher input, um, and we look at where our students are performing. Based on the results, students can fall into one of three tiers. The bottom of the pyramid represents tier one. Those are students who are proficient and on grade level with just normal classroom instruction. Um, students in the middle of the pyramid are considered tier two, and those are students who have fallen a little bit below the benchmark where we would like them to be at that point. And finally, that very tippy top red tier, uh, those are students who are considered tier three. And what we're finding is that they're not making adequate progress despite the tier one instruction and the tier two instruction. So students who are both 
tier two and tier three are students who we would consider to need supplemental instruction to support their learning and raise their proficiency so that they're meeting the core curriculum requirements and standards. So the benefits of the response to intervention model include that students have improved achievement, we increase graduation rates, there are fewer special education referrals, there's a greater equity between students. And again, it's a research-based approach that has been proven in improving educational outcomes. So RTI is really responsible for shifting a mindset from what is wrong with the student to why is he or she not responding to the instructional approach. Um, we have our problem solving teams, which we've had in place for a really long time now. Um, during that time, we meet weekly on each grade level and we really are dissecting the data in terms of what instructional plan can we put in place so that we can have said student respond to that instructional approach. Um, at that time, our instructional plans focus on specific goals, and the goal is to work in small groups, whether it's with the classroom teacher, who is the first and foremost AIS RTI provider, or one of our reading and math specialists. In addition, data and feedback drives this model, as well as our tiering, and of course, the number one um, asset behind that is our classroom teacher. Um, and, and I know with all of our problem solving teams, that is something where um, we heavily rely on what our classroom teachers have to say. Our instructional data warehouse, if you will, Branch and Minds, houses all of this data for us, as well as our tailored instructional plans for our tier two and three students, goals, and results. The importance of frequency is really, it's truly research-based. Uh, frequency has to do with how much time you're really spending with a child. Um, you also uh, bring in the idea of intensity. Intensity is that ratio of teacher to child. So in a small group setting, you're cutting down the ratio from teacher to whole class to a smaller group. Frequency, how much you're meeting with it. The, the research says the more you're meeting with the child, the better you're able to track their progress. You're able to uh, fill in any, um, any you know, necessary skills that need to be there and basically close their achievement gap. It uh, utilizes small group instruction method, and it allows you to truly individualize a intervention plan for each child in that group. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. RTI has, been sh has shown to reduce the number of students who are referred to special education services. By providing interventions and supports before the referral process, it's possible to help more students in a timely manner and reduce the need for special education services. So the benefits of small group instruction, I think he's seeing a theme here. Small group instruction has many benefits for both teachers and students. For teachers, it allows them to easily provide targeted instruction to each group and to assess the progress of each student. For students, it allows them to work together to complete tasks and develop social and communication skills. The research behind small group instruction shows that it is an effective teaching approach that can lead to improved student engagement, increased student collaboration, improve performance on tests and assignments, and increase student motivation and enthusiasm for learning. So small, small groups are a component of uh, a different model of teaching. So we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years on co-teaching training, uh, focusing on the different models. And the benefits of co-teaching are that it is, it is engaging. It's an effective learning environment, um, sometimes more engaging for students. You're able to increase student achievement, improve uh, class management, which continues to be a struggle when you're trying to break down into centers or into different models in the classroom. Um, it allows more collaboration for teachers amongst each other. And again, it allows that individualized instruction to meet the specific needs of each learner in the class. Co-teaching, it's an effective model because it truly allows two teachers or two, uh, two experts to work together, create that more engaging atmosphere, but they're able to collaborate together. You're able to blend the expertise of, say, a co-teaching classroom where you have a special education teacher and a general education teacher. That's two wonderful mindsets that you get to blend together for the, for the students' benefits. Um, co-teaching models, though, don't need to be limited to just a special education teacher and a general education teacher. You bring in a math specialist or a reading specialist to combine with uh, with a general education teacher, and you know we we, we think the potential is limitless. Um, you know, and that expertise all leads to that more balanced classroom and that individualized instruction that we're talking. Yes, me too. I don't. 
Um, there's much research behind any uh, behind co-teaching. We have been practicing it and living it this in, in, in for quite a while here. Um, but studies have shown that the model leads to more academic gains for students in the classroom, and it can be used with any grade level, any subject area. And that's that's truly important to know. It's an effective model for our special education classrooms where all students receive the instruction that they deserve. So for our students receiving RTI services, when we are able to provide push-in services, this enables the specialist to push into the classroom, avoiding the pullout. This avoids any of our children having to make up any missed classwork assignments, as well as playing catch-up. Um, we also find that many times when we have our data meetings, there is sometimes a disconnect where our classroom teachers might be seeing progress where our specialists are not or vice versa. So being in that same classroom setting where we have two of our experts, if you will, together, they're really able to get a better sense of said student and really dive into, you know, what's going on in his or her territory. So I know Dr. Ferris uh, feels the same way the principals do. Our goal is to do push-in services whenever possible. Of course, sometimes when we have tier three students um, and they need that greatest support, it's not always possible depending on where they fall within the deficit. Um, but our goal certainly moving forward is to go with push-in services whenever possible. So the research behind additional providers um, is, is clear that um, you know, additional support by reading and math providers show that students who have that support are more likely to pass reading and math standardized tests, have improved reading comprehension and fluency, um, improved math skills, and more likely to meet grade level expectations. But I think more importantly than that, um, the additional support allows students to receive individualized instruction that leads to greater self-esteem and resilience and self-confidence. Um, because as you know, we're not just focused on teaching kids academics, we actually focus on the whole child. So I actually want to share an email that I think is very um, appropriate that was written to Mrs. Panarello, who is our math AIS teacher, who's actually here, um, from a parent whose child was working with her. And it says, my son has been meeting with you since the beginning of 2022. I wanted to take a moment and thank you for the work you have been doing with him. I wanted you to know he always comes home in a positive mood after having spent time with you. He is an amazing kid with a lot of strengths, but he believes he's bad at math and has anxiety around feeling dumb. His day is brightened after working with you and he's becoming more confident in his math skills. Whatever you're doing with him, please keep it going and please let me know if there's anything we can do at home to support your work with him and keep this momentum going. So like I said, more importantly than teaching a student math, we're making him feel good about himself and getting rid of that stigma of I'm not a math person. So a success story we'd love to share from Terry Avenue. In the fall of a given year, we had a kindergarten student who we classified as a tier two, meaning that that student needed extra support more than a tier one and the services were provided by the classroom teacher. By the spring of that same year, that student went all the way to a tier three, meaning that that's the greatest amount of general ed support before a possible CSE referral. During that time, there were multiple parent-teacher conferences. The parent once or twice actually even thought about retaining the student, um, wasn't sure if she wanted to do a referral. Um, we were able to talk it through, try different things. The student remained in tier three through the middle of second grade until growth started to really show that the student was responding to some of the interventions put in place. After careful monitoring, the student <coughs> went from a tier three down to a tier two pullout, and then to a tier two classroom in third grade. By the end of third grade, the student was put back into a tier one group. And I'm happy to report that as a current fifth grader, continued being a tier one. And again, when we think about this, right, six years ago, this parent was thinking about retaining a student. And with the data, the problem solving team, and working with all the specialists, and of course, with the family, we were able to have a wonderful success story to show. So we hope to have more of those to show. And the graph, that, the graph that you see there is really what the difference is in RTI. So the top is just a student who would be tier one that doesn't need any intervention. On the right hand side is someone who just who would need that intervention, but is just getting core instruction. You can see the deep dip, the big difference, the large difference between that top line and that bottom line. And then 
someone getting research-based core instruction lifts it up a little bit, but having that actual research-based intervention by that specialist, look at the way that curve goes straight up and really helps line them up so, so much closer to what a student who doesn't need that extra support has. So I just wanted to point that out to the board that the research really was quite good. So what is our current configuration? Each of our elementary schools are the same right now. We have two reading teachers, one math academic intervention specialist. Our ideal configuration, if we could have everything we ever wanted in this pro for this program, it would be three reading teachers and two math intervention specialists to cover everything. However, we know that's not realistic. So what we wanna to talk to you about is, we looked at each building separately and each principal is going to talk a little bit about their building and their needs and the most pressing needs moving forward. So at Cherry Avenue, before when I spoke about cushions, I was referring to those students in tier two and three that are serviced by a math or reading teacher. But if you look at the orange on the bottom, if we had an extra reading teacher, we would be able to split it up K1, 2, 3, the little bit of fourth grade and four, five. And that bottom row, when it says cushion, we're not referring to necessarily students who are receiving RTI. We're actually looking at more of a co-teaching model where every single student would benefit from having another teacher in the room, whether it's parallel teaching, alternative teaching, station teaching. Um, we really found that reading, writing, and phonics, we really need that smaller group teacher-led instruction. Um, and you'll see in a minute that our Cherry Avenue faculty created a video. Um, you'll hear some testimony from them. You'll see them in action. But we do feel from a professional standpoint, we tend to underestimate the power of observing teacher, uh, students. Um, sometimes when we have, let's say, a speech teacher cushion or a reading teacher, they're able to see things that maybe the classroom teacher overlooked or vice versa. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're observing students, we want to maximize the time on task as well as teachers learning from one another, which I think a lot of times um, we sell ourselves short of. Co-teaching would enable all students to benefit from working in a reduced student to teacher ratio while ensuring instruction is tailored and differentiated. As we all know, COVID has impact impacted many students in multiple areas. Now more than ever, there's a greater need, especially in reading, writing, and phonics that we close that gap, not only for those students receiving AIS, but also many times for above grade level learners who we don't have that time to differentiate to the extent that we'd want to. Research has shown that students make the most gains when additional support is provided based on their needs. The next slide will take this a step forward and show you this in action. Very careful so it doesn't yes. I can name that song in one note. <laughs> Students can spend more time with their teachers and get more individual attention. And with more than one teacher, it's easier to teach students in smaller groups or one on one. <laughs> Classroom teachers will have the opportunity to work with a literacy specialist briefly. This will benefit teachers with learning different methods of instruction, ensuring students are on task, and keeping classroom morale high. This will also benefit teachers who may be new to the district or new to a grade level. to learn from teachers who may have different teaching styles, ideas, perspectives, and experience. It also makes it easier to implement differentiated instruction and personalized learning for all students. Teachers will be 
afforded more contact time with students. Small group work can take place with greater frequency. As a result, all students' needs can be met. What better way to shape social skills than seeing two teachers work together? Collaboration and cooperation are at the heart of the co-teaching model, which allows teachers to model appropriate behavior while interacting with one another. I think um, working in a small group is more helpful because you can come on ideas and you can work together with your classmates to learn different things. There are reading needs, but part of the foundational teachings that take place in elementary school is also mathematics. Um, so just a quick little brief piece about our current math instruction. Our tier one instruction uh, derived from, our curriculum is derived from Into Math. Uh, this is year two, three, three, year three. It's going by fast. Year three of Into Math. Uh, Into Math really focuses on a CRA approach, which is the uh, constructivist, the representational, and the abstract, where we're trying to get away from the fact that a number is so abstract and make it truly concrete. If you remember a couple of years ago, we actually did an activity with you all. We were building with number cubes and it was a little fun, but it was hands-on. Um, the, the curriculum provides differentiated instruction opportunities and resources for people to use. And the assessment that, that we use truly does drive instruction. Um, our teachers drive the instruction based on how their students perform and real right then information. We also complement our tier one instruction with our iReady online diagnostics and online instruction. This is individualized uh, for each student and student throughout the year. We'll take three um, ELA and three math diagnostics. They're an adaptive uh, assessment that truly gets the um, where the students are and it breaks it down into four different areas, number and operations, algebra, geometry, measurement and data. It's specific to the student's needs. And the best part of it is that, you know, we, we see, I'm sure all the teachers will nod their heads. There are kids that just want to click through sometimes, but teachers have the ability to say, okay, I know that this student is stronger than this assessment showcases. We're going to move their online instruction and specify it to what I know is best for the students also, not just what one diagnostic um, uses. And then moving forward. So Currently, the elementary model uh, for mathematics, um, multi-tiered multi support system, where we have that tier one instruction, if you think about that green part of the pyramid you saw before, and then we move up the pyramid to tier two and tier three. Tier two, we do chop in half in a little bit, uh, sort of where we have classroom teacher intervention, as well as out of the class or AIS intervention with our math specialists. And then tier three is a blend of that tier one, tier two, and additional support. So we may be increasing the frequency, the intensity for a child. Frequency in terms of how many days is difficult. And that's what we're going to get into here with our math AIS providers. We have one AIS provider in, in mathematics per building. They are experts. Uh, Miss Athen, she is my go-to in the building for all things math related. Um, they're, they're part of the problem solving team. They're teacher leaders. People seek them out on a regular basis. 
they cover kindergarten through fifth grade. That's all 18, 19 classes in a building, every student. They use a research-based program, um, also bridges in mathematics. Uh, it is a student-centered support based on what the students actually need, breaks down to its foundational elements and targets what intervention they specifically need. But this is the sad part. I'm not, I don't know how else to say it. Their caseload and the intervention that we provide for our students is limited by their schedule. Even today, we are having conversations. Well, we'd love to do a little bit more, but we just don't have enough room. We don't have enough people power. Did so, you say um, you have uh, a math specialist in each building? One per building. One per yes. building. Okay. So. so these are actually the hard numbers, right? So like Dr. Coy said, um, you know, it, unfortunately, some of what we can do is limited just by availability of staff. So if you look, uh, this is the data for Lincoln Avenue as of December, um, and the number of, so from for K to five students, again, we don't provide AIS for UPK, but for K to five students, 75 out of 375, 378 K to five students are identified as having uh, tier two and tier three reading needs. Um, we have two full-time teachers that can mm. provide service for those students. On the other end, you see that we have 83 out of 378 students who have been identified as needing assistance in math. And out of those 83 students, 36 of them have been identified in need of pull out services, but we only have one teacher. So even if you just do it mathematically, based on you know 30 minute sessions, the, the maximum we could give each student is two pull out times per week regardless of what they actually would benefit from because one person is trying to service 36 students by themselves as opposed to uh, the reading where we have two teachers who are actually servicing 35 students who are being pulled out. So we actually um, have a couple of little videos uh, I'll just share with you before we show them. Um, again, what we have really shown you is that we feel like ideally would we would have a push in model where the math AIS teacher would push in with the classroom teacher. Um, and we are able to do this in some situations. So these are some videos of a push in lesson in a third grade classroom. What you'll notice is that um, we have two teachers teaching simultaneously. Um, this is actually a station model, though, because you'll see that uh, the two teachers are teaching, but then we also have students who are working independently. Um, the teachers are actually teaching like the same curriculum and the same skill, but they're able to differentiate it very, very strategically based on the needs of the students who are sitting in front of them. So. <laughs> So again, you can see, obviously, it's much more effective for each teacher to be sitting at a table with four or five students. Um, and delivering the instruction than one teacher standing and talking to 20 students at the same time. So here are Sunrise Drive's specific numbers, tier two um, and tier three. Again, just similar to Lincoln, we have I mean, two circled areas. We have 69 students receiving reading intervention of some sort, and we have 67 students receiving math intervention of some sort. The inequity is the fact that we have two providers for reading and one for math. So how are we supposed to serve the students the way that we know is best uh, for that purpose? 
Um, and sunrise numbers that our enrollment's just a little bit uh, short of Lincoln's. You know, again, we have 32 students in our building that have special education goals, but this um, that's outside of those num outside of speaking through clearly right now. Uh, that's in addition to what we have here. So another piece of having that additional provider is you have on top of the numbers you see here, you have additional students that need and would benefit from more of that push-in model, more of that teacher um, support. So the plan. So currently, uh, the current, current level of service for both Lincoln and Sunrise on the top. So the, the pro, proposed level of service plan, similar to what Dr. Ryan was saying before about reading, is with adding another math AIS provider to Sunrise Drive or to Lincoln, what we're able to do is we're able to um, increase our intervention directly for the students that need it most, but we're also able to target every single student in the school to math academic intervention push-in supports, uh, oh, sorry, just push-ins during the week along with the tier two or tier three services that students receive. In the upper grades, the math service would have only one push-in, the need in elementary. We really want to build that foundation. I have an expert here that's going to talk a little bit about the why in a minute. Um, but the, you know, our tier two classroom students would receive everything a tier one would. Classroom teacher can provide more direct um, direct intervention in the classroom, and we can continue to elevate the need or the intervention based on the student need with up to three or even more pull out services to truly close that achievement gap that a student has in mathematics. And trust me, the curriculum comes fast and furious. Every day is something new. When kids get to fractions, they don't have a foundational understanding of multiplication, but they didn't have that foundational understanding of addition to do two-digit regroup it, 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 it just backs up and it's unfortunate for the student. So by adding another math teacher, we're able to have that more robust multi-tiered support service, more, uh, more targeted level of intervention for the student. Their need will drive what intervention they receive. And that's, I can't think of something more beautiful than that. Um, and again, we're able to have that co-teaching environment, change the ratio in the classroom, have more small group into you know, more small groups, different co-teaching models that we are becoming very, very well versed in across the district. Um, more in-depth knowledge of specific grade level uh, by having teachers that are specified to only a few grade levels rather than a K-5 mathematics uh, piece. Research shows that greater focus in number sense in the early years, truly adds to stronger mathematical foundation. And I said before, I brought an expert, and I can't think of a better person to talk math or a more passionate person helping children to, than Miss Carrie Athen to ask and answer questions. So Miss Athen, we want to know why why is this most important for our students? So I did have this. Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> all right. So Dr. Foy and I have been conversing a lot about this. When I found out that he was doing a presentation, I said, can I come? <laughs> so we started having a conversation about this, and this is my passion, and there's so much I would like to teach you about this. And I was going to. I really was. I have all these notes, and I was going to teach you all about the early numeracy concepts and why that's so important to build into the number sense relationships and how that connects to fluency, but I don't have enough time. And then I said, oh, that's funny. That's my life at teaching math. I have all of this knowledge. We have so many experts. We have so many physical resources and we don't have enough time to give to the children. So I know exactly what the students need, but there's only one of me. And so believe me, when we're at that problem solving table and we're saying, I say, I know this child needs a third day. I know if I could just more consistently reach this child, Oh, it's not in the schedule or, oh, their class is their, that's their prep, so I can't take it. There's just always roadblocks as far as trying to help the kids, and we do the best we can, but there's so many more kids we could be helping. Um, and to kind of build off of that, the whole point behind these numeracy concepts is that children need experience. They don't just need a teacher saying what to do procedurally and then them copying the procedure. And all of our teachers know that. They need hands-on concrete 
They need to move in progression of, to representational. Then they need to move to abstract, which is much later. That's algorithms, formulas, procedures. They need to learn the basics first. And in our younger grades, I only have time in my schedule right now to push in once a week to the three kindergarten classes. I could give them so much more if I could consistently push in because I don't mean to say this is great, but I am an expert mm -hmm. and this is my passion and I study it and I see, I take classes and I learn all about the importance of this. And some kids do great in that tier one population. They get what they need. And then there's the others. There's the ones that are on the tier two cusp, or maybe they need a little more tier two, or maybe they need t tier three. And anyone who knows me when I speak about children, I always like to speak about those with executive function challenges, and those are our neurodiverse learners. So especially now after COVID, I'm noticing, we're all noticing, so many more children are struggling with executive functions. So again, I'm going to try to teach you a little crash course. I'm sure many of you know, but these are the children who have trouble engaging. They have trouble planning and organizing. They have trouble with working memory. They have trouble sustaining attention when they're not completely involved or maybe moving. They have trouble flexibly thinking, which you absolutely need to do in order to understand numbers in their relationships and move along the progression. Some of them have emotional regulation difficulty where a big group is hard for them and they shut down. Um, and some of them just need help self-monitoring. And a huge part of what I do, and I know my colleagues who also work with small groups do, all the teachers, we work on that with them. That's a huge part of how they learn. Um, those children might need to just see it in a different way or have it presented showing in a different way or they need to do it themselves and experiment and explore and discover. Um, and there's just not enough of me to do that with all the kids who need it. So there's that other part of it where I feel like there's a whole group of children that we could be meeting their needs so much better and giving them what they need, but there's just, there's not enough time. And it's sad to me because if we could tap into this early numeracy and really help those children see it and build confidence, later on, there'll be so much less catching up to do. It's like they're starting behind and you can never catch them up because you're putting a band-aid, really. So you see them twice a week and maybe they're already behind in spatial relationships. They haven't even learned to supervise. And uh, again, I could do a six week course on this <laughs> and, and it probably sounds like Spanish to some people, but this is what they need. They need the time, they need the experience, they need formative assessment. So while you're working with a child, you see something's not working, you quick go to your toolbox and grab something else because that's what they need. What better for a child to have you sitting there saying, this didn't work, let's try it this way. And then for them to say, wow, that worked. Now I feel good. Now I know how to do it. I'm going to go back to class. So I'm going to do it that way. That's so exciting. And I feel so bad that we can't do that for more children. And then they grow up thinking, I'm not a math person. I'm bad at math. All the other kids in the class are faster than me. It's just so much of the mindset and um, teaching them to be critical thinkers, problem solvers. I just wish I had more time to do it. And so that kind of brings me to that push-in piece. Um, there's a lot I have to offer. And I a couple of years ago, we I did right before COVID, February before COVID, I started a presentation with the teachers and we, we addressed some of this and it was really well received and it was really exciting and I was all gung ho I was like yeah we're gonna get in the classrooms and then like school closed a month later <laughs> and we've been playing catch up ever since and all I would love to do is work with my colleagues who are amazing and so creative and so flexible and willing to do anything for their students they come to me all the time I go to them all the time if we could work together and I could bring them the things that I've learned help students like math discourse and number talks and fluency exercises, more small group support, additional tools. I have a classroom, if anyone's ever seen my room, with bins and shelves of manipulatives and fun things for the kids that 
I could show up every time with something new and, and spark their attention and get them motivated. I go to kindergarten now and they bring my little number stack blocks and they cheer. And I mean, kids are cheering for math. Let's do it. Like, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. So I, I just, I want to say thank you for letting me come tonight and share my passion. And I hope that in the future, we can reach a lot more kids. And I'm not saying I need help. I'm just saying we need more time and more people to do what we need to do. I, um, I, I just have a question for everyone. Mm -hmm. What I am hearing a lot of, mm -hmm. and um, correct me if I'm hearing that children today, concept issues on all in all areas. Do you find that's more so today Maybe because of the pandemic, maybe because of um, pushing things forward. I That's what think I see. Moving very quickly. The, the curriculum itself moves very quickly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and I'm not saying this for the, about teachers, I think it doesn't allow time for that deep understanding. And ha maybe if we had two teachers doing it, we could really focus on that deeper understanding. And I would say less is more. Like I don't want them doing five problems. Let's do one problem and dissect it. And let's have every kid in the class add to it. And they learn so much from each other because we know from research, children learn by discussing it with each other more than they learn from us. So if we had the, the resources to put them in that setting where they could get more of the basics, and where I could bring in, hey, look, let's do a fluency talk. Let's get them really thinking flexibly about numbers. Yeah, I think that I could just talk all day about it because I, and I do think technology is a big piece of it. When they're younger, they're not playing and exploring as much, some of them. Um, they're not problem solving as much. They're looking for the answers and get them like this. And they never even have to have that productive struggle. So when they're in school and they're struggling, they don't even want to deal with it. That's like, oh, I don't like that. That's uncomfortable. So like, it's really just teaching them. And like I said, there's so much in the small group work where you can address those things in a small group and make them comfortable and, and help build their confidence and give them the, the empowerment to make decisions for themselves as learners. I could go on and on. <laughs> I could ask a million questions. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll send you the whole time stuff. <laughs> and the other thing that I did notice, I, I want to say that I do help with uh, homework sometimes, and uh, I'm a math person, so um, I uh, sometimes a whole page or two pages of the same concept problems mm -hmm. um, at homework time uh, are once they have it, the first yeah. line, exactly. the rest is really. I think sometimes giving two pages, and I will say my grandchildren all out of the elementary, but all but one out of the elementary school, I will say I have them when I help them do the first line, and then I give them the answers to the rest. So they are teachers, I just want to tell you that's the truth. <laughs> because Stay going, right? It's just redundant. Why well, have and yeah, honestly, so I time for them to play and do other things might be more important than drilling. Yes, yes, communication, uh, talking to people, understanding different personalities, how people do things differently. Right. That's my feeling. So I'm, I'm confessing. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked with Finn, so. <laughs> But thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. My extension is 4101. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry, for sharing your heart with us. It's really important for everybody to hear. Um, so in conclusion, we really believe that each child will take a different journey on their path to success. However, it's our job to make sure they're guided, supported, and keep moving forward. By enhancing our AIS program, we can help ensure there are as few bumps along the way as possible. And I would just like to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank the principals for joining me tonight and for helping put this whole thing together, but also to our AS, all of our teaching staff, our AS staff, who do an amazing job um, with the resources that we have. So thank you for all your help. I see we have uh, our three elementary school principals. Can I just see a, a short hands on how many elementary school teachers are out in the audience? Thank you for your for us students, and thank you for supporting us. 
So I, again, I just want to uh, personally thank each of the three elementary principals and the teachers who were involved in the presentation as well as Dr. Christian. Um, the reason for that presentation is kind of the prelude to the budget talk. And then that's, you now have the why behind what you're going to see in the present budget presentation in terms of the instructional proposals that we'll be making for our budget. So again, I just want to thank that group again for their work. Now it's uh, time to get this uh, So tonight we're going to do a presentation, the first presentation about the school budget. Last week, we, or last meeting, we didn't do a presentation and kind of give a prelude to what's to come. Uh, this is not the budget as it will be. This is just a proposal for you. The board will have time to review this proposal. The community will have time to ask questions about the proposal. Uh, this is going to be discussed for several months until we get to March, April, when we'll make a final proposal based on feedback from the community, feedback from the board, and then that will be voted on by the Board of Education in April about to adopt a budget vote for the community in May. Uh, this presentation was not put on the uh, website uh, today because we were working on it until about 5, 30, 6 o'clock tonight, uh, but it's gonna go up as soon as the meeting's over, and then people will have several meetings between now and the time we vote to adopt the budget to kind of make a final decision about the budget. Um, so before we start to talk about what we want to do in the future, I think it's important to recognize what we have done in the present and the past with the funding that we've gotten from the community. So I want to introduce Dr. Christian again to kind of talk a little bit about our achievements and the work we've done with our students based on the budget we had in the past so that we can then look to the next one. Thanks, Dr. Travis. Right. So the slide above will show you all the things that have been uh, our successes for this year. So really, just an overview is that the instructional program in our school district really includes a strong emphasis on teaching and learning, curriculum development, technology, and support services. Our district boasts a successful student body with recognized AP scholars. Our students are doing enrolled in several colleges and universities. Our district has robust teams for RCI and problem solving and uses advanced SEL approaches for student and staff awareness. The athletics program is widely recognized with several student and coaching distinctions including league and county championships. We continue to provide rich curricular programs and exceptional opportunities for all students as evidenced by their performance and accolades. So these are just some examples of all the things that we have accomplished this year, and we continue to move forward and do more every single year. When I think about the budget, and this is my first budget presented to the Sable community as a superintendent, and I just wanna say it's been an absolute honor to spend these last six months with you just talking about our programs, talking to teachers, learning from parents about their experiences. We've run focus groups, we've um, collected surveys, and we are going to do a formal report out on those surveys and focus groups in the future. But we couldn't ignore that data as we prepared this budget. And I put three trinkets on the table here uh, just to illustrate kind of uh, the approach. Uh, these are trinkets that were given to me over my years in education as gifts. And they kind of uh, stay with me near and dear to my heart. The first was kind of like this, um, what do we call it, telescope. That's the idea of just constantly reminding us to look to the future. And when we build a budget, we don't want to just think about next year, you know, that's our job to develop a budget. We want to think about the next three to five years and always look to the future. So I keep this on my desk to remind me that we have to continuously look to the future. Um, this is a compass that was given to me a while back. I like to follow your heart kind of thing and know your true north. And for me, everything we do should be about our kids. And every dollar we spend, yes, there are things that are plants, there are things that are windows and roofs and things that keep people safe, but we have to focus on the things that impact our children most. And so this reminds me that whether it's a hiring decision, a tenure decision, a budgeting decision, everything we do has to be rooted in what we believe will impact children in the most positive way. And then this is probably my most um, meaningful gift. Uh, I was a principal and it was given to me by one of my teaching aides when I was a principal. And she has since passed from, uh, from breast cancer. But when she was in the building, she came to me and gave it to me as a present one day. I sat in the blue. I didn't have a birthday or anything. And she said, I saw this in the store and it made me think of you. And I said, why did you think it was me? And she said, because everyone always used to say, like, nothing's possible. We can't do this because of that. We can't do this because of that. And you always say, let's just make it happen. And so when the board charged me with creating a budget that focused on instruction and making things happen for kids, I use that as a reminder when we have money for this or money for that, that we can make it happen if we focus. And I want to compliment Sam Gerges. Uh, you know, the two of us worked 
for the last uh, month and a half, uh, going over every single line of the budget and kind of cutting out anything that really um, didn't kind of follow that true north path towards the kids so that we could make room in the budget that has a tax cap so that we could stay under the cap, but also add programs to the kids so that they could have some of the things that we need. So I'm really proud of this budget proposal that we're going to make to you because it is a budget that is under the cap, but also uh, creates programming and support for children uh, based on what they need. So uh, those are the three things that kind of came to my mind as we thought about this budget. Uh, we did a parent survey and we asked a question of the parents. Uh, if you know you think there's an area we should focus on, money is tight, but if there is an area, uh, what is an area we need to focus on for our kids? We also asked this question of the staff and the students. Uh, the students wanted hot tub, so we left some of that out. <laughs> but uh, the parent one and the staff one really kind of, um, that was one suggestion. Uh, but the, the parent one and the, the staff one really kind of were similar. Uh, the biggest finding from 335 parent responses was uh, more focus on STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, a uh, technology offering for students, overall building facilities, air conditioning for classrooms came up. And again, these are just what people want. It doesn't mean we get it, but we have to inform our decision making based on what people are asking for. Um, we looked and saw people wanting uh, support for curriculum, innovative approaches to instruction, and training for teachers. Uh, and that came up quite a bit. Uh, expanding the art music program. Um, a large number of people were asking for more focus on social emotional learning, diversity training, uh, this concept that uh, uh, Sable tends to be not a very ethically diverse community. And there's a world outside of Sable, so we want kids to be aware of that world outside of Sable uh, and not live in what uh, some people refer to as a bubble. Um, also, uh, transportation and school lunch offerings. People were really happy with the school lunches being free from the federal government for many years, and now that's coming away. It's putting a strain on some families. Uh, and you can see other things, uh, gifted and talented education, as well as special education services came up. And you're going to see some of these things reflected in our budget. As I said, we can't do everything. But you're going to see a reflection of what our teachers, staff, and parents are asking for because they connect to what is best for kids. Um, and again, uh, we're, we're looking for that. Factors affecting our, affecting our budget, uh, there are some expenses that kind of we got hit with this year that were larger than normal. So inflation uh, obviously played a big role in costs going up. So our food prices are up, our energy prices, our electric bills, our heating and oil way up so uh, again yeah, we, we've seen that that eats up a lot of our cap space when it comes to the budget when we're trying to build programs it makes it very difficult with two percent cap and those prices going up significantly we also saw the cost of goods and services going up and of course we have to build in each year the contractual obligations based on prior uh, contract negotiations in each of our units bargaining units have to be built in but the biggest hit came to us through the uh, increase in health insurance costs it's kind of put upon us uh, both us as a district as well as our employees got hit. I mean, people saw that in their paychecks as well as in our bill, uh, which we have to cover. So those things kind of made our expenses go up. Those alone went over the cap. So if we do nothing to our school district, change absolutely zero, we just try to do a zero-based budget, we're above the cap because of those increases alone before we even touch anything. So our job was to pull things away that would not affect kids. And I mean, Sam and I were in these like meetings, we felt like we were in a cartoon where they'd say, we need $600 for supplies. We say, how about four? And they'd be, all right, we can get it done for 450. Okay, great, $200, save. And then we go to the next one. We went line by line. And it seems like those things were little, but when we got to the end of those little supply meetings, we saved $75,000 in supplies at the teacher position. So uh, they're little, little details, but they make a big difference in trying to get a budget passed that's under the cap when your expenses have gone up above the cap before you even talk about teacher positions. We did get some help with revenue. The governor's um, state aid proposals, uh, she followed through on a promise that was long overdue for Long Island. Uh, Long Island schools got a 16 to 18% increase in state aid because we were very much underfunded compared to the rest of the state. So we've gotten some state aid that kind of helped to offset some of those costs. Uh, the um, interest rates going up hurt us in one way because all of our borrowing, we pay more for the loans. But on the other hand, money in the bank gets more interest because it kind of balances out. Uh, we have declining enrollment, so we want to take advantage of retirements and or programs that are going, you know, that are not needed, but not just um, let them go, but kind of take that and use that to put somewhere else to help kids in a different way so that we maintain the staff. Uh, if I've learned anything over the last 30 years in education, uh, stuff is great, but the most valuable resource we have is our people. 
and it's the teachers and the aides and the people who interact with the kids. And we have to maintain that at all costs and also enhance that as much as possible. As you see, we have a math teacher who's brilliant, uh, but she can't do everything. So yeah. I know you think so. In any event, so these are the revenues that kind of push up. And again, we have a 2% property tax cap, which kind of limits the amount of what we can do. So in developing the budget, we're trying to look at sustainability, uh, expand key areas of need, such as the AF program, which we're going to talk about, preserve programs that exist, uh, be creative about our approach, but also be rooted in reality. We can't do everything because um, it's just impossible. So we have to have like a five-year plan to get what we need. So yes, we, we need three reading teachers and two math teachers in each elementary building, but we're going to try to do that in a two-point phase-in. Uh, and in some cases, a three and four year phase in to get the things that we need for our students so that we can do it in a responsible way to keep the tax cap uh, honored and um, appropriate for our, for our taxpayers. Again, uh, we want to sustain the programs we have. We want to preserve staffing levels and provide additional staffing in key areas. Uh, we want to continue to support the expansion of our UPK program, which parents have said a lot about over the last couple of months. I've gotten so many phone calls and emails about nervous parents. Are we going to be able to get our kids into the UBK? It's so valuable for our kids. Um, and, and, and that's a, a question we're going to answer tonight in our budget proposal. And, and, um, and trying to you know, make sure that we have a budget that, again, is under the cap that gives our kids what they need. So the current um, kind of budget-to-budget -budget increase, we're looking at $102 million budget this year, which is a budget-to-budget -budget increase of 2.77%. Um, and a proposed tax rate of 2.85%. Uh, the question is, well, what is that above the cap? And the answer is, well, the cap moves, and it depends on inflation, it depends on CPI, it depends on a number of factors, which Dr. Gerges is going to explain. Our tax cap, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Gerges, is 2.85. Yes. So that's the tax cap based on the formulas we use, and a lot of that has to do with inflation, that's 6 or 7%, is that correct? Yes, but capped at 2. Yeah, but capped at 2. Okay. So, and he'll explain the details that go into that. Uh, my job right now is to kind of express, here's what we're doing in the budget, and then Sam's going to explain, here's how we're doing it and how we're within the cap. So uh, first off, pre-kindergarten program. In 2021-22, we had three sections of Lincoln Avenue, and the state funded us $248,000. Um, in the last year, we were given an increase in funding because the governor promised each year that they want to have a commitment to pre-K, and they gave us almost $400,000, so we had four sections at Lincoln Avenue. Um, I want to keep in mind that they have a weird way of doing it in that they give you $5,400 per student. So really, uh, they give you about $97,500 for each section you open. But it cost us $150,000 to run a section because you have a teacher and an aide in there. So, and that also includes supplies and materials. So even though the state is giving us more money, it does cost us within the budget $50,000 per section that we open, even though we're getting funded. So this year, the good news is we're getting $745,000. That means we're going to be able to open six to seven pre-K sections. And our hope is that every child who's asking for pre-K in our district will be able to receive it. Currently, currently, based on the enrollment numbers we have, we will be able to do that. However, if the numbers jump, we might not, and we have to figure that out. But currently, we're looking at six to seven sections located in each of our elementary schools. We're thinking two at Cherry, two at Lincoln, two at Sunrise, and if there's a seven, it will depend on the majority of students where they come from, because we want to get as many people a seat in their homeschool as possible. But this is, I think, really good news, because the state followed through on their commitment, and it makes it possible for us to deliver the community the pre-K program that people are really asking for. Um, our proposed positions for academic and instructional support. On the left-hand side, you'll see phase one, that's for this school year. I think it's really important to look at the three-year phase in though of, of our programs because we can't all do it in one year. So we are proposing one additional math position at Sunrise Drive, one additional math AIS position at Lincoln Avenue, and one reading AI position at Cherry Avenue. And that presentation that you just saw was an exact reason about why. Um, the other thing we're proposing is we putting a teacher on assignment to take a lead teacher role as an RTI coordinator and instructional coach. Uh, one of the things we've heard from teachers and just in general is we want consistency in the three buildings. So we would love a person, a point person to kind of look at the data, facilitate the meetings with teachers that have a consistent approach across all three buildings. And also, if a child is struggling in a class and a teacher is asking for support, someone who can come in, push in, provide support, and help give some guidance 
in the eight or six week period to try some things before they determine what kind of service the kid might need. So we see this as a feature in our district who can step up, someone who's respected by the staff, who has experience, and can really be a, a help and a support to people in the district. Uh, we feel that's really important because if we're going to add this AS programming, we also need some coordination and building principals are doing great work with this, but they can't rely on themselves alone if we want consistency across all three buildings in the district, as people have been asking for. Uh, and finally, and this was probably the number one thing that came up at Sunrise Drive and also at Lincoln, was um, if we really believe in co-teaching, if we truly believe that we want the six models of co-teaching to happen and we want to have the teachers be equal partners within the process, we really believe that there should be a full day co-teaching program where the teacher does not leave. So we need point four staff and for that, based on the other staff we have, to make sure that we have resource rooms covered and reading specialized reading covered by staff members and the co-teacher can stay in the classroom with their partners for the full day. So the thing that is really uh, exciting for me is we're proposing all of these things within the cap and the way we're doing it is we're reducing the stuff in the budget, but we're adding people because we know that people are the most valuable resource for our students. Phase two of this will be 2024, 25, where we would add the reading teacher position to Sunrise Drive, the reading teacher position to Lincoln, and the math ad teacher to Cherry, providing what was proposed to you earlier tonight, which was three reading teachers and two math ad teachers in the building. I think we gave a compelling argument for, we know what to do. Our staff knows exactly what to do, but we need the support. And what I don't ever want to hear is a teacher say, got these kids, I know what to do, but I just can't get the thing to do it. The other thing I think needs to be pointed out is with the push-in model and the second teacher pushing in one period a day, uh, it doesn't just help the kids who are struggling. It actually gives more contact time to the kids who are in the middle and the kids who need enrichment because the teachers get more time in small groups with everybody. So that model is a win-win for not just the kids who struggle, but also for the entire class and the contact time that they have with the teachers. Uh, and then the phase two or phase three, and these are kind of more wish list items that we believe would be helpful, would be potential, and again, this will be discussed more as part of our five-year plan, a director of elementary literacy as an administrative position in the future to coordinate literacy uh, and to kind of support the reading teachers and the AS teachers in the work that they do, as well as two elementary instructional coaches. Uh, we right now pay about $100,000 a year for the reading and writing workshop. Uh, we get about five days in each building, and teachers say that they just feel like that's not really as helpful as it could be. If we're really committed to doing good work, we need coaches in the buildings all the time. If the teacher is starting a unit, they have questions about the unit, someone should be able to come and sit with the teachers, look at the unit, plan it out, redesign the unit. Uh, we believe in the teacher's college. We believe in the reading and writing workshop approach. We don't necessarily have to follow the teacher's college, teacher's college manuals if we have people in the district who are assigned to support teachers in the development of our homegrown units of study. And so we believe in that very strongly. Again, we're not voting on, we're talking about that or that this year. That's for the future conversation. Right now, you're looking at for our budget, these left side phase one, 22, 23, 24. Um, so uh, before we continue with the presentation, are there any questions from the board about this aspect of the presentation? Could, uh, the only question is, could I get a copy of so this because it's Absolutely. interesting. Thank yeah, you. I'll print it up. Instead of me writing everything. Yeah, you can have everything. It. Thank you. I think we should do that for the kids too. No more notes. Yeah, get the notes. <laughs> Can't write that quickly. Additional uh, enrichment and scheme. We've talked a lot of the elementary principals, and this is kind of feedback from families and from staff. We have these steam labs that are in each building. We have uh, uh, science aids in the building, but it would be really beneficial, especially with the next generation science standards to have STEAM programs and better enrichment programs in each of the elementary schools. We have an enrichment program now that kind of visits each three schools on a cyclical basis, but parents have been asking for those programs to be enhanced, as well as more science and technology. We know for a fact that there's a very uh, low number of females who go into the engineering field when they uh, graduate college, and those industries, the employers are dying to have a female perspective in the engineering field. And the research is clear that if you start STEAM programs early in K through five, you get students interested in putting female students, you build a program in middle school and to high school. And if we have a world-class program in our high school, middle school, and elementary school, we'll be sending more people who are interested in the STEAM field, which are one of the most fastest growing fields and most employable fields in the uh, country. If you're an engineering student and you're a female, you will get a job for $180,000 right out of college. This is just guaranteed because they're looking for so many people to do this instead of hiring people who are not you know, living in our country. Um, 
Phase one would be to have one teacher at Cherry do a pilot program, do the enrichment and the science at the Cherry School. We chose that because Lisa Iron was very interested in that for her building. And also uh, there were a lot of other programs at the other schools and we thought this would be a good place to start. And then in phase two, we would add two, uh, one to Lincoln Avenue and Sunrise Drive in the following years. And we had that program kind of tested out and then we would expand. It also could be a resource for the teachers um, where they could work with their science colleagues, provide support both in the classroom and when they bring them down to the science lab. And we're going to talk in the future about a capital project where we want to really redesign those science labs and create state-of-the-art 21st century learning labs in each of our three elementary schools. But that's down the road for the future. First, we want to get this off the ground so that we have a real compelling case for why we could use this in our school. And finally, Maureen, are you ready? <laughs> we strongly believe that uh, teaching world language at the elementary school level is not only good for the cultural experiences of our students, but also uh, taps areas of the brain that develop problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and a whole host of other outcomes. So we are proposing a slow uh, introduction in kindergarten twice a week to a language program in French and Spanish. Uh, and that would be for next year, it would require us to increase our staffing by 0.5 FTEs. Uh, and then in the following year, we would add another 0.5 for grade one. In the following year, this would be a five-year commitment in grade two. We currently have a three through five program, but it's not quite consistent because they rotate eight weeks at a time to each building. We really would want them to have it for the whole year, not just for eight weeks. So we would phase this in grade three through four. And then the idea would be in year five, we also have to look at the middle school program because currently in the middle school program, they do like a wheel of French and a wheel of Spanish, and then they decide for seventh grade. We believe that if they have this experience from kindergarten to fifth grade, they can decide at the end of fifth grade and then get an every other day program in sixth grade on year long. So that in itself, total over five years, not for next year's budget, Next year's budget would only be the 0.5, which may be offset by some uh, enrollment lowering. So if we have lower enrollment in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we may be able to offset the cost of this through uh, closing a section at the middle school, opening a section at the elementary school, but we're budgeting for both. Um, and the idea would be we need three full-time teachers total to make this program whole in each elementary school. We'd have one line teacher in each elementary school. However, it's only a 2.5 total increase for staffing because we currently have a 0.5 dedicated to the elementary school. But it's a slow drift to try to get this to happen. So our incoming kindergartners will get it next year and it would follow them through elementary school until they got to middle school. So by year five, we would have it. But it's a commitment from the board to do this year, but also next year. I just want to say, um, from what I heard, one of the requirements that they're looking at it at the state level, which maybe will bring us some funding, is language at the elementary level. Because there was a study done how uh, the brain works, the younger you are, obviously you will learn it. Yeah. Um, also, this is not uncommon in other districts surrounding us. Have no, it's not. So, the, so that's a, a point five FTE at each building. Uh, so for next year, it's a point five total for the district. That's what I mean. We're only going to do kindergarten. So 0.5. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a five-year commitment, 0.5 each year yeah. over a five-year period. So over five years, it's going to be an increase of 2.5. But what I will tell you, and you're going to get a you're going to get like you had a presentation yeah, tonight really on, to um, on the RTI. You're going to have a presentation on March 3rd, I believe, on world language. We're also going to do a presentation on STEAM so you get a better sense of what the STEAM is. Mm -hmm. And really, we'll get to come up with feelings about all of these things and the enrichment that we're going to be offering. And then you'll get to decide whether you want to adopt this or not. Uh, I, again, say that all of this is done within the context of the cap. Um, so it's a regular you know, budget vote. We were just very, very um, creative and particular about how we cut certain things out and put this in. Uh, even today, Sam and I were $300,000 in the hole, uh, making phone calls to different directors, trying to get that budget whittled down so we could keep all this stuff in because we were thinking we'd have to present to you this and say what do you want to cut here but we really um pared it down to a point where we got it so that we could do this within the cap without cutting any of it uh, or we could go lower than the cap and you could cut things out it's like that's the choices you as a board will have to make as we get to the point. I also want to say since you brought up girls in STEM uh just to my family which I don't like doing but three females are into one is teaching STEM in Nassau County, 
uh, head of the STEM department. Two others are into computer research. So we do have women leaving SABO that are doing well in STEM. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that goes back. So now I'm going to invite up Dr. Gergis. I explained the vision for where we're heading. He's going to explain the nuts and bolts behind how we get there and still be under the cap. Dr. Gergis? Thank you. Welcome to second budget cycle. As, have you, as you heard, the foundation for the 23-24 uh, budget and some of the principles that. So as you'll see on the screen, you can see it will also be posted on the website back on either of the screen. The budget, uh, proposed budget for 23-24 is $102,048,891. And as you see the breakdown of salaries and fringe benefits similar to other years, we constitute about 75% of the budget similar to many other places. Uh, you see a debt service number, which is higher based on some of the borrowings that we are assuming uh, for the bond that was passed in 2022. Our contractual expenditures, our proceeds costs, which uh, do, have gone down um, due to several different uh, factors and enrollments, our supply budget, our textbooks and workbooks, which is uh, remain steady, our transportation budget, we're going into year four, five-year contract, and our standard transfer to capital and special aid fund along with the bond. So as you see, the year-to-year -year budget is a 2.77% increase, which equates to two, about $2.75 million from year to year. <clears throat> so on the revenue side of the budget, as you know, much of the what was discussed was the expenditure side, we do see an increase for 23-24. Uh, foundation aid, again, increased by the minimum percentage here in uh, Sable due to the settlement of the New Yorkers for students' educational rights lawsuit. Primarily what that solved were several districts that were not held harmless and were owed lots of money that went back to the inception of Foundation Aid back in 2008. Um, those districts, you might um, read about them or know about them in depth. They did receive larger quantities, but we did receive at the end of the day an increase in state aid. Ours was $240,949 uh, from year to year. Our other income expenses did go up significantly. That is primarily due to interest uh, rates on our monies that we have invested that did go up significantly. So that's a nice offset. And we do continue to use our fund balance reserves purposefully to offset any sort of limited or decreasing revenues and also to stay within the tax gap of, that we calculated at 2.85%. Um, our fund balance appropriation, as you see on the screen, it's just over 549 million. That's actually only $8,000 shift from year to year. And finally, the projected tax rate is 2.85%, representing an approximate $228, $228 annual increase or $19 a month for a home trust of $40,000 within SEMA. So the allowable tax levy growth factor, also known as the tax cap, we'll go through it briefly. At the December meeting, I did mention that the tax-based growth factor uh, is 0.21, I'll make it simple. Um, in a nutshell, what does that mean? It's new constructions and additional taxable property items within the community. Um, the tax levy growth factor is based on the annual CPI ending December. And as we all know, inflation was sky high. However, the way the law states that it's either the rate of inflation, so I should consider price index, or 2%, whichever is lower. So in this case, we obviously do lose the 6%, 7% increase. We did lose the 2% because that is the lower factor. I have to say that is the first time since the tax cap has been in place that inflation has been this high and it was firmly capped at 2% without, without question. Um, to compare, last year's tax levy growth factor was 1.14, so there was some additional uh, room there. And as I just mentioned, it was the lesser 2%. Going through the eight step iteration, the estimated tax levy is calculated to be 2.85%. Now that's the, the maximum. And Going back to what I had said, that 0.21 is the second step, six more steps lead to the 2.85 factor. So as, as was mentioned, the projected tax levy increase um, is at the tax levy limit. That is where we are with the projected budget at this time. And to kind of go over the actual details of the revenue and tax rate schedule, you see our state aid uh, increase from year to year in the first of pilot payments. Uh, and also our other income, uh, which is nominal in comparison to the rest of the budget, spans from adult education, admissions, um, you see the interest income, we are projecting at a much higher amount based on actuals this year, but also 
the consistency of interest um, on our operating accounts, um, our rentals, insurance recoveries, and tuition from other districts. That is uh, tuition that we do receive from other school districts for educating their students. So our total state aid and other incomes you see on the bottom is 32.455 million. And if we look at our fund balances and our property taxes, as you see there's only really an $8,400 increase in our appropriated fund balance, um, coupled with our property taxes to give us our revenue side, which matches the expense side of $102,048,000. $891 for 2.77%. So shifting a little bit, which we discussed last uh, year, last budget cycle, uh, we did speak about the instructional part, but one of the key components of any school district is the capital or the district infrastructure part. And, you know, just to kind of briefly review, what does that entail? Buildings and grounds, a custodial grounds, maintenance support staff. They are responsible for, for preserving the district-wide facilities, the buildings, the grounds, the turf fields, uh, we are guided by what's known as the Building Condition Survey, which is uh, periodically updated uh, both by uh, the Facilities Department and our architects, so we can prioritize what areas require attention. Um, and why is that? Because we have to facilitate the connection between conducive and welcoming learning areas and environments and you know, when students walk in and their experience. Um, also, it affords us the flexibility with student accommodations when necessary. Um, as we did last year, and we will hope to continue this year, redesigning spaces for our UPK program and its expansion. Um, the the uh, continued community use of the district facilities and also the energy performance contract continues to yield savings, especially during the time where electricity and gas costs have, uh, have reached into sky high territory. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is a we'll try to put up last year, but just trying to give an idea of some of the major uh, infrastructure additions and also the year that each building uh, was built here in uh, Sable and to be actually the old junior high school is actually the oldest that we were at 1926 that it was okay. uh, built almost 100 years ago. <laughs> that service, again, a chart that we always forget to the community where we stand. Um, and as we see um, right now, we're still in a decent area where our debt service is in the, in the range of about three and a half million, but that, that will fall off. That is not, I should mention, include any debt service related to the 2022 bond, as those projects are still at state end and we're still finalizing uh, debt service schedules based on our approval and when they would actually hit books. Capital initiatives continue addressing our facility upgrades and improvements uh, necessary to keep up with infrastructure maintenance and utilizing new methodologies and products, timing, financial opportunity. Um, we do have a minimal uh, decrease in debt service with our building A ratio of 68%. It's actually 6% for any approved capital expenses. And building A in subsequent years is something that we always keep in mind and account for as we continue to provide the safe learning environment that we uh, speak about for our students, staff, and the community. To review the bond work that was approved in May of last year, it is the reskinning of roofs, the first phase. We are hoping and projecting for both Sayville High School and Cherry Avenue Elementary in the summer of 23, in the summer of 24, the following three buildings. Um, they do come with a 20 year warranty, and if bond funds allow, as mentioned last year, potential air conditioning upgrades at Sayville High School. I um, just want to mention the reason that two out of the five are this year and three out of five are next year is due to the scope uh, of work, and they can only do it during the summer, so without any sort of interruption during the school year um, of anything that is going on at the buildings. Commitment to funding of technology. <clears throat> Again, this is an update. As you see, July of 2022, what we purchased in terms of Chromebooks and cases, what we have from August to last month, February through June, upgrade our wireless access points, uh, replacing um, the math lab in the high school for the art department, and the computers that we're waiting for delivery, um, the L50 and L10s. And one of the initiatives we worked on, Parent Square. Are uh, rolling out that since uh, since July, and also currently upgrading the turf field press box to improve the sound and just the overall appearance. So, starting to you know bring this to a conclusion. Yesterday we did receive the executive budget proposal. Typically we do receive that around the 17th, 18th of January. But every four years there's a provision in the law that allows the governor to you know put it off for a few weeks as they're transitioning in. And, and New York State does have an interim budget director as their longtime director, 
uh, departed. So um, we were working pretty diligently to not just only put in our numbers, but also dissect what, it, what was included in the executive budget because there are small pieces that eventually trickle down to school districts um, in terms of grants and other programs that it's important to be mindful of. So the, the key thing is continued funding of foundation aid and the state's commitment to fully fund that initiative over the next uh, two years, resulting from the New York State Students <laughs> Educational Rights Lawsuit. When I say two years, I mean this year and next year, once the budget is, is formally approved. Uh, state aid did go up 34 and a half billion. That represents a nearly 10% increase uh, statewide. Foundation aid, you see the breakdown. The expense-based states, that's still a formula-driven uh, increase. Um, and UPK aid, uh, another three-year initiative proposed by the state is increasing by nearly $161 million, as also reflected earlier. The continued investment in child care and universal pre-K continues to be a priority with the state and in their words, to meaningfully expand the availability of child care to New York's working families. Other highlights, um, as the budget is still being dissected, there are a lot of teacher and instructional supports that are built in. There's a grant that is uh, in the budget called the Teachers of Tomorrow Grant, for both retention, incentive, and recruitment. Um, the teacher mentor intern grants, which will work hand in hand apparently with the top. Uh, the employment preparation education aid, those are uh, both for teachers and those pursuing a career for alternative education uh, teaching. And this was something that was highly debated whether there was going to be a provision in the budget for universal lunch, breakfast lunch, an item that was. Um, obviously granted during the pandemic, it expired last year. It didn't make its way through the budget, but they did put uh, 20 some odd million in there for additional lunch breakfast program subsidies. I do think that there's probably going to be another push to have universal meals because it did curtail a lot of um, sociomotive issues um, with students that are starting to rise again. I do know that there are several advocacy groups that are pushing and fighting for this. And I think you see that this is going to be a forefront issue. Just to go over some of the district's uh, health and finances, we did receive the fiscal stress report a couple of weeks ago. As you see on the screen, we actually have a no designation for the eighth straight year, which means there's no fiscal stress. One of the environmental stresses that they recognized last year is off the uh, report, which is very good. And again, to recap what was also discussed at a couple of meetings ago, the 10 year enrollment projections, we see the trend data from 23 24, the projected year ahead to 2032, 30 uh, uh, school year. And we do see that there is a decline in the three uh, building areas. However, there are some upticks in certain years. Enrollment trends summarized on the screen, as you see that the past 10 years uh, yield was and what the next 10 year projection is, and also <laughs> the configuration and also percentages expected by 2032. So in summary, the 23-24 draft one proposed budget, and again, this is the first meeting of the budget cycle, is $102,048,891, a spending increase uh, representative of $2,746,000 or 2.77%, it does carry a proposed tax rate of 2.85, which is at the tax levy limit. The increase is projected at a house value of $40,228 and $19 a month, and currently it is at the tax levy cap. Finally, at our next meeting, we will look at the details of the expenditure side of the proposed budget in depth from what uh, was presented and the potential establishment of the capital reserve fund. Within that, we'll look at salaries, print benefits, debt service, our contractual expenditures, both these supplies, textbooks, and workbooks. And I thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, at this time, Dr. Burgess or myself, uh, or any of the cabinet members, will take any questions on the board if you want to have a go around. Uh, starting with James and the way around, if you have any comments or. No, I think I appreciate. The responsiveness. I mean, this. I, I feel like there's a, a degree of engagement. I think that you know we've had a lot of discussions with building industries and the public. I feel like people are being asked more what their priorities are, which is, I, and I think it's authentic. I appreciate. It. I appreciate the inclusivity and you know the focus on building and staffing as well as maintaining you know the, the high level of facilities that we have. So thank you. Great. 
Oh, I, I love the idea of moving forward with um, the language program. Because as I said, I've been doing this for two or three years now. <laughs> and uh, finally, we're moving ahead. I think it's very, very important. We are a global society, whether people like it or not. Uh, and I also am very happy with the SEM program because I think we, we need that for all our students, even though it's a smaller percentage of students, for some people we can. It's still good, o opening doors. I agree, I'm really excited to hear more about that. And I think we're off to a good start. Thank you. I think it's, it's a really exciting, um, really creative, and how you're able to manage all that under the tax cap is pretty fascinating. And I want to know what that 1,500% increase oh, yeah. is. Sure. That's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I want more of those. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd actually like to explain that. Because, um, let's turn back the clock 15 years ago. In 2008, when the economy was um, at the cusp of the recession, interest rates were hovering around 4%. And that was a very big budget line for uh, a lot of school districts, municipalities, and governments because the money that they have invested in the bank that's from tax collections and other revenues, they collect interest on that monies. In the span of about a year, that rate went from 4% to about half a percent, three quarters of a percent. Reflective, as with any sort of borrowing, that stayed the norm for probably about the next 10 years or so, with some, some fluctuations up and down, but nothing, um, nothing significant. As a result of the economic conditions that have happened, when we say interest rates went up, yes, they do go up. They do up for mortgages, they go up for borrowings, but they also go up on the flip side for any sort of banking or investments that you may have. Sometimes it's not as comparable, but we do have to reflect and account for that within our budget. And that has been one of the key areas that allowed us to uh, bring this budget forward in this capacity. Okay, and is that enough money to clone that math specialist? Uh -huh. <laughs> because we need more cards. <laughs> well, as you can see, uh, we, we budgeted as an ass teacher, but really it's her name twin. Yeah, it's Steve Bogle, I hope we have a cloning <laughs> aspect to it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gerges and Dr. Gerges. I think a wonderful, especially the, especially, uh, the universe pre-K all the buildings, this certainly is a, uh, uh, a great, great thing. Great thing to have on our desk and all the other answers. So it's uh, off to a very good start. And uh, thank you for drilling down to all the other all the lines. I know it could be a tedious process, but we looks like we safely can control some money and we're able to enhance programs in addition to by doing so. So thank you, John. Well done. Yeah. I just wanted one other thing about my language program. I was I would like to take credit for it. <laughs> but really, but, but all your I want to say, Joe Verdone, when he was our superintendent. He started a language program at the elementary level. Carl, I think you had languages in elementary school. <laughs> you More did. Time ago, it yeah. was, I know. I I know. It was, you know, but so it was in the 80s. We had it, we had to cut it because of funding. And that was unfortunate. So I don't want to take credit for it. Either. Agreed. All credit goes to one. <laughs> Thank you, Maureen. Yeah. 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 Good job, Maureen. <laughs> he should. All right, at this point, that's the end of my report. Now we're up to the board. Well, well, thank you. Uh, we're going on to a uh, board discussion. We have about uh, seven items there right now. Uh, the first item is we have to take a look at the uh, 23-24 uh, school calendar. So um, just basically the Eastern Suffolk Votes puts out a calendar every year of what they proposed districts can take that and or um, adjust it accordingly based on the needs of their district uh, we mirror we mirror most of that but we've made some slight adjustments to the needs of our, uh, our our group here and if you have any questions you know pete helped to put that together with us so any questions please do. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over item two. Uh, number three I, I'm going to speak to this which I happen to see the play at the, uh, at the old at the high school uh, I'm wrinkling time in, in a little theater and what I did not, first of all, fantastic act by our students, and certainly Doug Shore did a fantastic job getting, getting, getting there. But the lighting in there is kind of, uh, what we're, it's not particularly good. I mean, it's just like you have Home Depot extension cords to lighting. I mean, I think our, our, our kids deserve a little bit better than that. Uh, the seating's a little a bit uncomfortable, so it's, you know, 
a theater kids, we should really uh, make it a point to sort of address some of those needs of that little theater. At, yeah, at and can I answer that? Because several times I hear about the microphones or the, the headsets, but they're yeah. not yeah, adequate yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, I've talked to Ari Kramer about that. Um, we've got actually proposals for lighting at the middle school and sound, lighting at the high school theater, and we're getting a proposal for the small, small theater tomorrow. Well, okay, okay. Really well. great. Um, it's definitely something we need to address. It's not currently in this budget, but one of the things we're going to be talking to you about next meeting is the opening of the capital reserve, where we can use funding over time to build up our classroom instructional spaces, our science laboratories, and also the upgrades to the to the theater program. So that kids, I want our kids to walk into those spaces and say, "Wow, our district loves us." You know, as much as a football player loves walking onto the turf football field, and it's got to feel the same amount of pride and love in every space a kid walks into, depending on what their interests are. So mm -hmm. that's definitely a high priority list. We talked about it in this budget, and in this budget cycle, we we prioritize the staff uh, positions over stuff. But that's why we want to talk next next meeting about the capital reserve concept putting money away, building that fund up, and then spending it for those kind of things. And what that does, and you'll hear more about this in the future, is it then when, instead of having to go out later for large bonds that the community has to vote on and feel like they're too big, uh, you do smaller bonds and then you do mini capital reserves along the way to kind of keep things uh, up to date over, over a period of time. So we'll talk more about that next Certainly, week. I can see addressing this budget, but I understand. Mm -hmm. I just want, for better word, I want to bring light to it. So, <laughs> John, before I, you move on, I just want to say, um, I know Kelly was there as well. We were at the orchestra concert last night. And just because you brought up Ari Kramer's name, um, first of all, it was great. It's, oh, I'm so glad it's back. It's been gone for a couple of years. Um, but to see the progression of the fourth graders up to the okay. seniors, yeah. um, it's just, oh, it's so amazing. Yeah, it's it really wonderful. is. Um, and, and, you know, all of our music teachers do an amazing job and, um, Ari Kramer obviously is taking his position as the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah he's <laughs> the, uh, doing a great job. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And I think he was a, a great choice. So, please mm -hmm. make sure that it's well, hey, yeah, sure. yeah, yes. <laughs> I was usually here. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry to miss that. I generally try to get five. Couldn't make that one. Uh, number, uh, fourth item is a long legislative breakfast this, uh, for, uh Saturday at Adam Longwood. But we do have a couple of our local legislators going to be there. Of course, the daily head is, I, I, I think Jared's office is going to be there. I know Doug Smith is going to be there because I spoke to him this morning. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, our Congressman Andrew Garberino is going to be there. And a couple of other, Alexis Wack may be there, et cetera. So it's always a good opportunity. Uh, I do know I will be there. I think uh, yes. Dr. Gerges is going uh, and a couple of other community members are going too. So it's a, it's a great event. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a question and answer type thing. Sometimes I have the questions ahead of time. Uh, sometimes we give them the questions ahead of time, but we don't ask those questions for reasons because we want them to answer questions. And it's always it's another good event. Uh, another item on the agenda for uh, next week, and our, our own Dr. Gerger is going to be presenting this to the National School Boards Association, School Finance and Literacy Beyond the Mandate, uh, it's February 8th at the high school at 6.30 for the board members. Uh, and the exec Eastern Suffolk Annual Executive Briefing, February 15th down in Riverhead. This is always a good one because it's getting by the culinary students. So it's a great meal. And, <laughs> that is good. That's and good it's idea. also a great presentation by uh, by Boses. Uh, and uh, number two is a student exchange. I think we've had a couple of questions from community members regarding this. I don't know, Dr. Uh, Jillian, would you like to speak of this or? Yeah, we used to, um, prior to COVID, we had student exchange. We would have students come from other countries and stay with host families. And then during the pandemic, obviously that has that was ceased for the time being. And now we have, it seems that the student exchange offices have been reaching out again to gauge interest if that we wanted to restart that program. Yeah, I had again, I had a couple of community members reach out to me and want to know if we're gonna start it. Is it too late this year to do it? Obviously, it's too late this year. For this current year, year yes. But next year. Yeah, I guess we can have a I think discussion one of the things we want to talk that. about is um love the concept but want to make sure that once we restart it we have rules and procedures in place to make sure that it goes the way it's supposed to go for those children who are involved so before we get it started we want to make sure we kind of map that out but we do believe in the concept yes we have a strong history of it i mean yeah. it's mm -hmm. for, i can't think of a time when we didn't have more yes yeah. right. you know i've known a couple of students going through anything and actually they'll be coming back and forth yeah, so, yeah. yeah. interesting okay thank you any other board item discussions? Okay, great. We're going to move it on to a uh, public session. I'm sorry, we're a little behind, so I'm just going to read it. How many people are going to speak tonight? Can I just see a show of hands? Three? Okay, thank you. 
The Board of Education and Administrators listen carefully to what members of our community have to say. We follow regulations specified by law and policy as we encourage our community members to offer public comment at Board of Education. The Board of Education requests that anyone who participates in public sessions demonstrate civility as they address the board and community. Board of Education meetings are held in public view, giving the public the opportunity to watch and listen to proceedings of the board. In these meetings, district staff updates the boards on matters pertaining to the school. The board may be required to take action on matters related to the district operations policy 1230, provides the opportunity for a period of public comment during this meeting. With that in mind, we offer a brief word on the parameters of the public comment period. 30 minutes will be set aside for comments and questions by the public, and the agenda is moved. The board reserves the right to limit public participation in any given case or to the extent the maximum comment period is deemed necessary. Questions and comments by the public are limited to three minutes per person. Speakers I ask to identify themselves and or the group they represent. Speakers should conduct themselves in a civil manner and direct their comments to the board. The board will not permit discussion involving individual personnel, students, or community members. Thank you. Uh, so if the, I saw three hands will go from right to left, or left or middle. <laughs> just hold on one second, let me just get the time right. <laughs> I'm not going to go ahead. Please start. I actually was not going to speak until Dr. Harris. You just said that we need clear guidelines on the program that you were just talking about, the um, mm -hmm. student exchange. Yep. Yes. And I realized in that moment that I needed to speak tonight. So, good evening. I'm here to, um, I'm going to share some facts. My daughter's name is Kaylee. She is eight. She was new to the district. She tried to make friends. She would go ask girls to play with her and they would tell her no. She would come home and make a plan for the next day. We would role play on who she would ask and what it might sound like. She went, went on for days. This went on for days. I informed the teacher and the recess monitors. She would go ask a different girl to play and they would tell her no again. One day, Kaylee learned that the reason these girls kept on telling her no is because there was a peer that were telling them that they weren't allowed to play with Kaylee. Different girls heard this peer state that she was going to stab Kaylee in the neck with a pencil. The girls were brave and told their parents. The parent called the school. The school failed my child and never told me. I found out by accident 12 months later. As a mother of three daughters, I'm here tonight to make sure that the administration and DASA coordinators of our school buildings no longer display tolerance and acceptance for bullying. I need to know that my children's physical and emotional safety are never in question, that administration is transparent and forthcoming with all information. There needs to be clear guidelines to make sure that when a child, parent, or staff member reports information that can be harmful to a student, it is investigated, documented, and communicated every single time. No one investigated the threat that was reported against my daughter because there was no physical harm done. However, as stated on your DASA fact sheet on your school website, harassment is defined as creation of hostile environment by conduct or by or verbal threats, intimidation or abuse that has or would have effect to the unreasonable and interfering with the student's educational performance opportunities or benefits or mental and emotional or physical well-being. Explain to me why then that an eight-year-old child tells their peers not to play with my daughter at recess because she is new and then tells her peers that she's going to stab her in the neck with a pencil. Is this worthy of an investigation by your DASA coordinators? I have spoken to the building principal, the social worker, and our superintendent already. They are very aware of this situation. I have received apologies. I have received promises on how Kaylee will be helped and how programs will be put in place to help new children to the district. But I still have not received an answer to my number one question. And that is how will our school guidelines be made clear so this never happens again to my child or anyone's child in the Sable community? Thank you. Thank you. And before I step away, I want to know how that answer question is going to be answered because I've been waiting for an answer and I have not received it. I will call you tomorrow. Thank you. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Thank <clears throat> you. 
So despite all the love talk about SEL, I have some significant concerns about the Pause and Connect program that's being mandated at the high school, as well as programs like it that I expect are on the horizon. I honestly don't think you'll hear from many parents because SEL programs are packaged to look so benign. And uh, on the outside, that looks beautiful, but parents do not consider the negative impact that SEL can have on children, especially when it's mandated. As a parent for more than 15 years and a mental health professional for approximately 25, I am concerned that programs like this can backfire and that they are part of an agenda I cannot support. I hope you and the parents of Sable will consider some of the following points. One, we must 100% trust the facilitator to follow the exact layout of the prescribed curriculum you've given them and not fill in the blanks with their own personal thoughts and feelings. This will be extremely difficult as the facilitators in this program will be sharing their own personal identity charts and bio poems with our children. Two, no one can predict what the students will bring up during the shared journal writings, group discussions, and other assigned activities, nor how the facilitator, who is not a mental health professional, will handle it. And if a child is uncomfortable with an activity or topic, they would have to advocate to leave in the middle of it, which would cause them embarrassment. Three, these SEL activities are taking time away from academics after almost three years of learning loss. So in one breath, everybody tonight is complaining about how children are behind academically, and in another, they're shortening class time twice a month for group therapy and social skills. Four, the kids are expected to trust staff they do not know, and peers who developmentally struggle to abide by confidentiality with their innermost thoughts and feelings. Most parents have taught their children that only their most trusted and loyal friends and family could be entitled to their private thoughts and feelings. I am very proud to have taught my children that, and I will not have the schools negating it. Five, not every child needs a program like this. According to UCLA Center for Mental Health, schools need to avoid the assumption that they need to develop universal programs to identify and address young people who may be experiencing problems. SEL programs that are mandatory are an assumption that every child wants or needs support outside of their home and that every parent condones it. Some parents definitely want you to raise their children. Others do not. Maybe some children will want to attend a program like this after school, but forcing all students to listen to and participate even passively in an SEL program is absolutely not education. On a final note, I'll wrap it up, John. You got time. My daughter wants no part in the SEL program. And that was for her own reason, not at my encouragement. So I've been asking for weeks to opt her out or to have a complete alternate alternative assessment to fulfill your mandate to your quote unquote curriculum. Because I was told she can't opt out of your curriculum. So now SEL is curriculum. Um, but I have not gotten any answers. So after trying to call, and emailing and going back and forth and still waiting for an answer and getting a runaround, my daughter was forced to sit in that session yesterday for the SEL program Pause and Connect. She was absolutely terrified, uncomfortable, and embarrassed to be in there. And you harmed my daughter. You harmed her emotionally by forcing her into that program yesterday. We parents promise our children that um, we will always protect them. And yet yesterday. Now I'm going to ask you to finish. Yeah, that two more sentences, John. Okay. Yesterday. Due to the administration's unwillingness to relinquish their control of my daughter, I could not protect her from her own school. I will say what I've been saying this entire school year that you seem to refuse to hear, and that is to stop trying to parent my children. Thank you, Pete Thomas. We'll see this later. Come on. Later. Anyone else? Last one? Yes. So I received a letter from Dr. Paris shortly after the blunder with the Unity Club almost field trip. And I would just like to express my thoughts on that and perhaps on policy. I'm looking for my notes, I've scribbled all over the place. In your email to me, you mentioned basically it was only 14 students, which I understand. However, I'd like to know how many parents were relieved to hear we almost hurt 14 students. That line doesn't go well with me. It shouldn't be, oh, it's only, it was only 14. That's not a relief. It should have never happened, in my opinion. 
there needs to be some due diligence somewhere in the district. The Unity Club needs another advisor to advise with the current one. You don't just plan a field trip and not see who the speaker is. I want to sign up myself. The whole thing came up right. But. So my suggestion is to have another teacher, perhaps not as progressive, work together with that teacher. That's true unity. What that speaker was about wasn't unity. Okay, and if a teacher is not looking into who the speaker is, that's not good. We need either reprimand or change something up with that club. Okay, because I'm for unity. I'm for all the children loving each other really and being friendly and no bullying, but that wasn't good. And the club has had problems over time. I'm sure we, when teachers retire, they will speak instead of coming through me. Additionally, I don't need to hear that you're for social justice. To me, there's no term social justice, not justice, it's not justice. And some groups ahead of others, it's political nonsense. If you want what you're trying to accomplish, truly accomplish, you would leave the kids alone and we'll get up and go fight to have your property taxes based on income. I've studied privilege, power, law. That's what you do. But none of you will do that because I don't really think you want what you best to say you want. You don't want that. We need some policies in the district. One, in your policy manual, teachers and our students shouldn't be exposed to politics and activism in the district. You're missing that policy. And you also need a policy that parents, I know they were, you said they were, had permission, but if the teacher is claiming she doesn't know who the speaker was, well, then the parents aren't told. So we need a policy to tell the parents, all parents, who the speakers are with the bio in that field trip. And then that parent will be fully informed. And they have that right, okay? So we need those two policies at least and I have your minutes from another meeting that still have a teacher's name, or actually administrator now, and it's nothing personal, but you didn't have the negative comments that were made at the same meeting about another teacher in your minutes. You can't open meeting law, case law, states you can't do that. You can't do positive if you're not allowing negative and vice versa. But I'm going to ask you to finish. I'll give you the same courtesy as I give the other okay, speakers. So I would be balanced. The meeting minutes to you from that meeting where both staff members were discussed, only one still in your meeting minutes, either remove it or put the other one. That's the proper way. But please consider policy because our our staff, not only our students, but our staff needs to be protected from politics and activism. This academic school, correct? We're not an activist institution. And you need you need policy. And Thank please you. consider changing up unity club to add another teacher work together. Thank you. Yeah, um, Thank you. I'm going to say that I disagree with a lot of what you said, but I think we could talk about that if you want to talk to me tomorrow about it in person. I also just want to state that when you make comments about staff members on social media, we do take it personally because you're it's true, about kids. So you can't just, just say, uh, don't take it personally. But Dr. I just Sarah, want to just say that you're right. Two positions here. They are named completely different. It wasn't the same position. A new, a new okay. position. I, I think Dr. Parrish. Dr. Parrish, you're using it. Yeah. I think Dr. Ferris gave me up, gave an opportunity to reach out to you. If you want to have a meeting with Dr. Ferris, please give me a call. I'll just send you the papers I was emailed today. That will, that, will work, that will work as well. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Right. Is, is that it for public session? That's it. Great. Uh, if we're okay, take a two, two minute break. You want to just pop through this? No, pop through. Let's pop through. Next time the agenda tonight is, uh, <laughs> um, sorry, approval minutes of January 12, 2023. Need a motion, please? Second. Second discussion. All those in favor? Motion carried. In a motion without any objection, could I go, go up to uh, 7 1 to 8 2, please? Second. Second. Discussion. So, wait, wait, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we have a discussion for 8 1 policy review. Okay, so can yeah, I go? Stay there. Yeah. Okay, let's go to 7 1. So we. Go to seven three. There's objection now. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Can I call seven one to seven three, please? Yeah. Yeah. Motion. Motion. Second. 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 Discussion. No. No. No discussion. Motion carried. Okay. Hold on a second. All those in favor? Favor. Yeah. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is, I guess we're going to discuss on the eight one eight one. Uh huh. Uh -huh. 
Uh, any motion? Yeah. Need a Discuss. second? Discussion. Discussion. Yeah. Okay. Discussion. You want to go first? Well, I just have a few. I, I feel like my, um, I feel like some of it's, some of the homebound instruction policy is worded awkwardly, and I just kind of reworded a few things. Um, similar to the wrongful conduct policy. Yeah, that needs to have some discussion. Okay, uh, we've had discussion. Now you want to wait for the policy if it is. Uh... Yeah, we can wait for. Yeah, I, well, I have just a couple of things. First of all, Nizba obviously recommends these, and that's we like a to do. Yeah, yeah but hold, it's like a huge statewide view. Mm -hmm. um, I really think that as we look ahead, not like right now, but ahead to you know, our five-year plan, we really need a policy committee. We need someone who digs into these. I, I we can't, like, yeah. we can't sit here and, and we, waste we time ago, arguing yes. over mays and shalls and musts and wills. Yeah. Someone needs to right. go in. I see sort of, right now. Oh, I hate the rules. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we can make a But we do. We need a policy committee and in the future. I think yeah. it's we, and we yeah. did a year ago. Yeah, yeah. this is, you know. Because so, we're going to argue that so, we, we, we now just put together a proposal to give to you next week about a policy committee about who would be on it, and then yeah. you guys can approve it. And, yes. it, and again, do we run, run these by as is? Do we run them by our council so, to see what they are? Uh, yeah, yeah, can I say we divvy them up based on our department? So, uh -huh. Kelly, I the homebound instruction like falls under PPS. Okay, so some of those were like updated regulation mm -hmm. that we have to enact as, in terms of the wording. I'd be happy to that. Yeah, we should properly written yeah some of them. yeah yeah i had a lot written about the the wrong code the whistleblower policy mm -hmm. there was a lot of shift of power and and responsibility and it was kind of interesting so do we want to know what the background all right then is. they make this recommendation can we table those policies yes yes good yeah we'll yes. table yeah. those policies and discuss it the next board meeting yes yes the motion to table uh, motion. Eight, eight one motion second i mean discussion all right uh we're going to take policy eight one until a uh, future board meeting Rules and favor. Oh, okay. Motion carried. Okay, uh, eight two. Need a motion? Motion. Discuss Second. all those in favor? Or uh, discussion or all those in favor? I'm sorry, I messed it all up. All those in favor. Okay, motion. Right, we have a faculty who needs to get their lesson plans together for class. Does that mean they could leave? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you. And now we can take why don't we just do that? That's it. That's it. Dates. No, we got to do it. Uh, What's upcoming, upcoming dates? Up See you next days. Thursday. Uh, high school. Upcoming dates uh, all district chorus on the 7th and Board of Education meeting on the 9th. Uh, yep. Okay. And, all right. And I need to adjourn to an executive session to continue our the previous discussion. Yes. We are adjourned to executive session. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you all for staying. We have a five minute break. Okay. Uh, we have a five minute break. <laughs>